Hi, my name is Phil Yeager, and I'm an instructor at Dunwoody College of Technology and Computer Networking. And today I'm going to be talking about the OSI model and other internetworking models. Today, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start off by talking about some of the internetworking models that we currently use. There are really three of them that are standardized by different standardizing organizations, such as the International Standards Organization. The first one is what's known as the ARPANET reference model, which is RFC 871, which is a great read. Um, that was invented back in the early days of the internet. The model was formalized in September of 1982. It's a three-layer model, and later on in one of these segments, I'm going to be showing you that three-layer model. The second big one is known as the TCP IP internet working model. Uh, it's the same one that Cisco basically uses, except for a few minor name changes, and that's under RFC 1122. It's a four-layer model. As I said, Cisco uses that one. The only difference between this T TCP IP reference model and Cisco is that on the network layer, instead of calling it the network layer, they call it the internet working layer. Then, of course, we had the big one, which is known as the OSI model. It was originally started in around 19, in the late 1970s. Uh, there were two competing organizations. One was the International Organization of Standards, and the other was the International Telegraph and Telephone Consultative Committee. That's a lot of words. They were both working on pretty much the same standard that ultimately became what's now known as the OSI model. It was in 1983 that the documents were combined. And it was called the Basic Reference Model for Open Systems Interconnections. Once again, a lot, a lot of wording. So now it's known as, we commonly know it as the OSI model, but it's also known as the Open Systems Interconnection Reference Model. And that was standardized under ISO 7498 in 1984, I believe it was. And this is what the OSI model looks like, uh, at least in my classroom. Um, it's a seven-layer model representing from the physical layer all the way up to the application layer. Now, please don't uh, confuse the application layer with programs or software such as Microsoft Word or Excel. Those actually sit above this layer. And the two layers I'm going to talk about in this segment are the physical layer and the data link layer. The physical layer is the layer that actually conveys the bit stream, whether it be through an electrical connection, an optical, or radio frequency. The physical layer, obviously, it's physical. It's, you can touch it. Wire you can touch. You can mold it. Um, and the PDU, or uh, protocol data unit, is called bits because that's what is streamed across the um, physical layer. But the data link layer, if you will, I consider half of it being physical also, because it's a network interface card. It's a circuit board with diodes and uh, transistors and, well, I'm not an electronics guy. But the other half of that is logical. Logical meaning it works off of firmware. It's not something you can touch. And the PDU at that level are called frames. And they're called frames because by the time it gets, the, the PDUs come down the stack and they get to the data link layer, it's framed. And the back end of the packet is framed with what's known as a CRC. And that's why we call it a frame. Up until that point, all the other layers only add a header. Now, in the data link layer, we actually have two sub-layers. One's called the LLC, or logical link control. The second piece is called the MAC, or the media access control. Starting with the MAC, this is what actually generates not only the MAC address, but also, it's what 
puts the signal on the wire. It's what creates the signal that is generated, either electrical, optical, or radio frequency. The LLC, it takes care of things like message delineation, when, and when to start and stop the message, error control or correction, um, and also uh, frame synchronization and flow control. So the, the data link layer does a lot of work. Now, at the physical layer, as I said, it generates the electrical, optical, and radio frequency signals, and it also defines the hardware that we use, such as a type of wire, whether it be a coaxial wire, twisted pair, um, fiber optic, whether it's single mode fiber optic or multi-mode, um, what, what the jacks look like and how they fit together in the, into the ports, whether it be an RJ11, RJ45, RJ48, um, or whatever. And at the data link layer, that's where the interface to interface delivery is. Meaning, interface being the NIC, say, on your laptop, which its next hop would be possibly a switch in the classroom or maybe somewhere hidden in a closet near your classroom. It's from network interface to network interface card. Its address is a MAC address. And if you will, I have here AB colon CD colon EF colon 01 colon 023 colon 45. Just to show as an example, a real MAC address would not look like this. It would be a jumble of these things. But it's always six octets. And that number is a unique number to every network interface card available. Uh, it's kind of like your social security number. Everybody has a unique number. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to find you on the internet. Now, some of the protocols that we work with, and these are just a few of them as an example. There are many of them. Down at the physical layer, today we use Manchester, or Manchester I'm sorry, signaling. Um, which is done both by synchronization and time. We also define the hardware at this layer. And as an example, I put down here coax, twisted pair, fiber, jacks, and ports. Um, if you've ever used things like parallel printers or even today's printers at US USB, that's also here at the physical layer. It's all about the hardware at this point. At the data link layer, this is where a lot of the protocols that um, come into play, such as 802.3, which is Ethernet, 802.5, which is token ring, and then, of course, 802.11, A, B, G, and N, N being the newest, uh, which was just ratified in September of last year, and then 802.15, which we all use. Um, with our, primarily our phones or possibly some of our printers and things, uh, that's Bluetooth. We also include ATM or asynchronous transmission in this layer, FIDI or fiber distributed interface, frame relay, point-to-point uh, -point protocols, and point to our layer two tunneling protocol, which is Cisco's um, protocol, and then the, the kind of open one is point-to-point -point tunneling protocol. So a lot of things like VPN all runs at the data link layer. These two layers in other models are actually combined into one called either the physical layer or in some models they call it the link layer. Nowadays um, with the creation and the beginning use of um, IP version 6, one of the routing protocols, OSPF, has now actually been moved down to the data link layer. So 
those of us that are working with routers and things like that are going to see that a little differently as IP version 6 comes into play more often. Also at the layer 2, or the data link layer, this is where layer 2 switches are to be found. Layer 2 switches are nothing but forwarding devices. And that's why they're called layer 2, because they deal with the MAC address. When you start getting up into layer 3 switches, and they start using the IP address, some call them, actually call them routing switches or routers. They're not true routers. They're done, it's done by a piece of firmware inside the switch that allows for routing. And nowadays, switches, of course, are known to go all the way up to layer 7. But most switching um, in most areas are still done at the layer 2. In the next segment, we're going to be learning about the network layer, or layer 3, and the transport layer, layer 4. This is where TCP IP happens.